Let us pray. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Many years ago, I was teaching a Sunday school class. My students were mostly teenagers, but they were smart as a whip right there. And one of them had a dad who was a pastor. She was the first one to find any passage we were talking about. As the Sunday school class moved through the church, the other leaders in the church said, you get that class. They were that bright. In one of our lessons, we were studying the passage from Luke 15 that talks about how God seeks out the lost no matter what. There's a story of a shepherd bringing back the lost sheep to the fold. There's a story of a woman sweeping her kitchen until she finds a lost coin. There's a story of a man welcoming home his lost prodigal son. So we read through all of these lessons, and I said to my students, the best and brightest in the church, now, in the first story about the sheep, who do you think God is? And they said, God is the shepherd. Yes, I think so too. And in that other story where God is the father, or where there's a father welcoming home a son, who is God? And they said, God is the father. And I said, yes, I think so too. And I said, in the third story where a woman is sweeping, at, looking everywhere in the house until she finds a lost coin, who do you think God is? And to a student, they said, the coin. God is the coin. And I said, well, God is looking for the lost sheep as a shepherd, and God is looking for a lost son as a father. And here we have a woman looking for a lost coin. Who do you think God is? I said. And they said, you mean God's not the coin? And I said, I don't think so. Who, who else is in the story? Who else could God be in that story as a God who seeks out the lost? And they said, well, surely not the woman. Surely not the woman. I said, I think, I think maybe it is. And it blew their minds. We are so conditioned, not just teenagers, but adults too. Whenever we see a woman show up or a feminine figure show up in scripture to say, oh, that is somebody's sister. That is somebody's mother. That is somebody's daughter. And rarely do we think that is somebody. That is somebody. Even more rarely do we think maybe that woman in that parable, in that story, is showing us an image of God. But how would our faith be transformed? How would our faith be transformed if we could look at such feminine figures, if we could look at the woman searching her house desperately to find a lost coin, if we could look at women in general as images of the divine? That long passage that Rick read for you this morning from Proverbs 30, 31, a woman of strength who can find, sometimes translated, as Rick will tell you, as Eshech Hayil, the Hebrew, a woman of valor who can find. It's a beautiful passage describing a woman who does good, who is shrewd in her business dealings, buying fields. She knows how to weave. She opens her hand to the poor. She makes coverings. She speaks with wisdom. She looks after her household. It's a beautiful description. And too often, for some Christian women, this beautiful description from Proverbs 30, 31 is used as a prescription and not a description. If you were a good wife, some churches might say, you would do every single one of these things listed in the Bible. It's right there. Why can't you do this? And what was a beautiful description of possibility and valor and trust becomes instead a way to clobber women over the head for once more not being good enough, not being able to do everything and be everything. There are lots of ways of reading the scripture, right? Not every single passage is meant as a prescription for living in 2024. There are other parts of Proverbs that we've studied over the past few weeks that describe women 
as wisdom or wisdom as women. In Proverbs chapter 1, for example, Scripture says, Wisdom cries out in the streets, in the squares she raises her voice. How long will you love being simple? In Proverbs chapter 2, Wisdom says, if you accept my words and treasure my commandments, I will make your ear attentive and incline your heart to understanding. In Proverbs chapter 8, it says, does not wisdom call and understanding raise her voice? She stands by the city gates and says, simple ones acquire intelligence. In Proverbs chapter 9, it says, wisdom has built her house. She has hewn seven pillars. She has said, you who are simple, turn in here, eat of my bread drink of my wine, walk in the way of insight. Over and over and over again in this book of the Bible, there's this figure of wisdom, a divine figure crying out in the streets saying, listen to me, heed my words, pay attention. And so, because this is a a pattern that's happened over and over in this book of the Bible, I ask, what would it be like to read this chapter of Proverbs, Proverbs 31, intratextually, within the text? What if we read it not as a prescription for how to be a good 21st century wife, but rather as a description of some of the things that God's wisdom does in the world Here are some of the verbs from Proverbs 31 that Eshet Chayil, this woman of valor, this wisdom figure does. She does good. She seeks. She brings food from far away. She rises while it is still night. She is strong. She perceives her lamp does not go out. She opens her hand to the poor. She reaches her hand to the needy. She is not afraid. She supplies. Strength and dignity are her clothing. She opens her mouth, and wisdom and kindness are on her tongue. Her children rise up and call her happy. What if, just what if, all of that list of actions is not only what a wife can do? What if it is some of the things that God can do in the world instead? Doing good, seeking and rising, being unafraid, opening mouth with wisdom, extending a hand to the poor. Sometimes God is a noun, and there are many, many images for God. Sometimes God is described in beautiful adjectives and poetry. Sometimes God is a verb, We know who God is based on what God does. The book of James, as Rick pointed out, highlights this too. James says to follow Jesus means to show show wisdom not just by words, but by actions, actions that are done not for show, but with appropriate humility. Show by your good life, James said, that your works are done with gentleness that is born from wisdom. James goes on to describe this wisdom with words like, it is pure, it is peaceable, it is gentle, it is willing to yield, it is full of mercy. It has no partiality, no hypocrisy. We know who God is based on what God does. And the challenge for us is to listen when God, to pay attention when God is doing something new in this world. I live with three teenagers, and teenagers are not renowned for their ability to listen to someone else's wisdom. I don't know if you knew that or not. So almost every day in my house, there are conversations about who gets to tell who what to do. Who gets to decide whose job it is to wash those dishes? Who gets to decide what time people have to get up? Who gets to decide what the rules around cell phones are? And the sentence, you don't get to tell me what to do, comes up almost every day. And sometimes I do get to tell them what to do because I'm the mom. That sentence comes up a lot too. But sometimes they're right. 
Sometimes my teenagers are of an age where I don't get to tell them what to do anymore. I don't get to tell them exactly how to talk to their friends. I don't get to tell them exactly how they're going to spend their money. I don't get to tell them how they're going to conduct themselves in the world. I have to trust that they are drawing not upon my direct commands, but on the wisdom that has been built up for them over the years by their family, by their community, by their faith tradition, and that that wisdom will carry them through to adulthood. Wisdom has authority that lasts longer, that adapts better than the authority born of just knowing the right answer. You can have a lot of knowledge, but not a lot of wisdom. One of the aforementioned teenagers quoted to me this proverb this week as we were talking about this text. They said, knowledge is knowing that a tomato is actually a fruit. Wisdom is not putting the tomato in your fruit salad. There is a difference between knowing the right answer and having the wisdom about what to do. Wisdom has authority. Wisdom has authority over men and women and children. And it is too big of a temptation, I think, even for adults in our culture right now to see and hear voices of wisdom and say to those voices not, wow, thank you for their wisdom. I will reflect on that and change my heart. But rather say to those voices, you don't get to tell me what to do. Have you ever felt that rise up in your throat when someone is giving you some wisdom? Maybe you let those words escape your mouth. Maybe you don't. But have you ever had the experience of feeling those words rise up and wanting to say them? You don't get to tell me what to do. Sometimes the person doesn't. Sometimes they're being bossy. But sometimes, if you're like me, you might be tempted to say, you don't get to tell me what to do when what actually you're experiencing is some wisdom that you could learn from, that you could change from. The question in our country right now of who gets to tell someone else what to do is extremely important. What if the people who got to tell us what to do were the wise people? What if it had nothing to do with how old they were or what gender they were or what race they were or how much money they made? What if we looked for wisdom where it may be found? What if we looked for those qualities James describes as wisdom from above? People who are meek, people who are peaceable, people who are gentle, people who are insincere. These are qualities of the heart. But James also describes people as, who are wise as open to reason, full of mercy, impartial. These are qualities of the mind. James specifies qualities of the heart that reflect God's wisdom. He specifies qualities of the mind that show God's wisdom. He does not specify any qualities of the body that lead to wisdom. He does not specify age or gender or race or makeup or hair or clothing or socioeconomic status. Who do you know? reflects wisdom. It might not be that person with the long gray beard and the staff who kind of looks like Gandalf. There might be somebody in your life who reflects meekness and gentleness and impartiality that looks very, very different than what you might imagine a wisdom figure looks like. Wisdom is not just a woman crying out in the marketplace. Wisdom can be a child offering to pay for the school lunch of a friend who has no money left on their account. Wisdom can be a grandfather making cinnamon buns for the women's shelter every week. Wisdom can be that one dissenting vote 
that one person who has the courage of their convictions to draw a line and say, I can go this far, but no further. Wisdom can be an elder who's unable to drive, but still able to make phone calls and send notes in times of trouble. And yes, wisdom can be a woman or a man or a child or an elder. Wisdom is the image of God showing up on our doorstep when we least expect it, asking if they will find shelter in our hearts, in our churches, in our homes. So this week I pray that you will be wise, seeking out gentleness and sincerity and generosity of spirit. I pray that you will be open, willing to listen to place to wisdom from places that you did not think you would hear it. And I pray that you will be brave, that you will be brave, trusting that you too can be a channel through which God's wisdom flows so that all who thirst for justice can be satisfied, all who, those who thirst for hunger and mercy can be fed, and so that all those who feel lost Sheep and people alike, all those who feel lost and trust, they will be found.